1968, a shot rings out near the Lorraine Motel in Memphis. And by the time people realize what's going on, American icon and civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has been shot and will soon be dead. The killing sets off a month-long manhunt spanning multiple countries searching for this man. An escaped convict, a career criminal, a con man, and an amateur porn director named James Earl Ray. In his book, Hellhound on His Trail, Hampton Sides explores the bizarre behavior of James Earl Ray leading up to and following the assassination of Dr. King. The year before the killing, Ray was sitting in a Missouri prison serving year seven of a 20-year sentence for armed robbery. And then one day, he slips out of prison on a bread trip. Following his escape, Ray spends a few months bouncing around the U.S. and Canada before landing in Birmingham, Alabama. Now, it's unclear exactly how long he was in Alabama, but it was at least long enough for him to buy a car and secure a new Alabama driver's license. Now, at this time, he was going under a number of pseudonyms, including Eric Starvo Gulf. But this was nothing new to Ray. Even when he was a child, his father made the family go by fake names in order to avoid his own run-ins with the law. And while he was in Birmingham, Galt, a.k.a. James Earl Ray, ordered some camera equipment through the mail. And when it arrived, he headed on south to Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. His plan was simple. He was going to pass himself off as a professional porn director while building a catalog of footage with Mexican prostitutes, and also sleeping with some of them on the side. Now, remember, this was just months before the assassination. Now, this lasted for a little while before Ray decided to give up on his dream life and leave Mexico after he had a falling out with a hooker that he had been dating. So he headed up California way to work on the presidential campaign of George Wallace. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Yes, that's George Wallace. Meanwhile, Ray was also taking bartending and dancing classes. Oh, and he got facial reconstruction surgery. And this seems to be when he decided that he was going to kill Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Now, there are mixed reports about his motivations. James Earl Ray was certainly a super racist, but it looks like greed may have also played a factor. Now, Ray was under the impression that he was going to be able to collect bounties from a cabal of rich southerners for killing Dr. King. And he also assumed that a white man would never be convicted for killing a black man in the South in the 1960s. Wonder where he got that idea. And even if he were convicted, he assumed that when Wallace inevitably became president, he would pardon Ray, not only for the assassination, but all his other past legal troubles. And keep in mind, he's still an escaped convict. Oh, and just for good measure, he also apparently thought that the assassination would get him in good with the African nation of Rhodesia, a country that is now Zimbabwe. At the time, that country was ruled by a white minority, and Ray had designs to become a mercenary in Africa. So he traveled on south to Atlanta, where he stalked Dr. King, eventually making his way back over to Birmingham, where he purchased a rifle and a scope. He eventually followed Dr. King up to Memphis, where Dr. King was organizing a march in the Portuguese. And that is where James Earl Ray took that fatal shot from the bathroom window of a rooming house across the street from the Lorraine Motel. Now, because the police arrived on the scene pretty quickly, Ray was forced to leave a bundle containing his rifle and all his belongings on the street near the rooming house. Turns out the police had been tracking King's activities through Memphis and were already basically there. Ray flees to Canada, which is apparently way too trusting in 1968 because he's able to get himself a birth certificate and a passport as Ramon Snade. He was basically financing his life at this point through a series of small pickup jobs. Snade then flew to England and made a few attempts to hook up with mercenary groups throughout Europe, but with no luck. And one day, roughly two months after the assassination, during an attempted meeting with mercenaries, Ray's passport is flagged, and that was the end. Although he maintained to authorities that he was not this James Earl Ray character, but he was actually Ramon Snade. And then there's this one kind of weird story where he kept insisting to his own attorney that he was Ramon Snade. An attorney was eventually like, okay, well, that's great, but you're still going to be here for a while. Is there anybody you want us to call? And he said, oh, yeah, talk to my brother, Jerry Ray. And then, boom, he was taken back to the U.S., where he eventually gave a full confession. But then all of a sudden, the story changed. While initially copping to the assassination, he later changed the story to say that, yeah, he did buy a rifle, and, yeah, he did stalk Dr. King. But the actual shot was fired by this mystery man named Raul, who had ties to the U.S. government. Now, no evidence was ever found of the existence of a Raul, but we should note that there are some members of the King family that do believe this story because they believe the government was involved with the assassination. Now, the case was repeatedly opened over the next 30 years, and while it has been revealed that the FBI was tracking and monitoring Dr. King, the verdict has always been the same. James Earl Ray acted alone in the assassination. 
He was a lifelong con man who died behind bars in 1998. And that's the story of the escaped convict who killed one of America's greatest civil rights leaders. For Reckon, I'm John Hanley.